chaos in the heart of London. The city streets, once the epitome of order, now bear the scars of relentless turmoil. Protests fueled by flames of discontent have erupted time and time again. Pro-Palestine activists using the city's iconic landmarks to convey their message. The battle lines are drawn and the fate of London hangs in the balance. Will order be restored or will chaos continue to reign? Sky News Digital Originals presents London Has Fallen. Ever since Hamas attacked Israel on October 7, pro-Palestine protests have swept across the world, nowhere more so than London. The world is watching as chaos ensues in the historic city. Unfortunately, the pro-Palestinian protests have become a coalition between uh, those who are genuinely concerned about the plight of the Palestinians and those who are just anti-Semitic and malicious and hateful and have no problem screaming uh, hateful things on the streets of our capital. And, and it's really deeply unfortunate. I mean, if you look at the sort of pro-Israeli protests, they, they're, more, they're more like vigils. You know, this is a, a nation that's been traumatized by the events of October the 7th, and they really just want to see peace in the region, however way people disagree on how to achieve that. But you have pro-Palestinian marches that are intimidating MP you know, we had basically a conscience vote uh, in, in the, the Commons last week where they asked for a ceasefire, which obviously has no bearing on what the Israeli government chooses to do. It was just a symbolic vote. But you had people harassing MPs to the extent that MPs actually abstained from voting um, to, to have their views on the matter showed in one way or another. And it is really deeply unfortunate and concerning. Um, wow. I mentioned last week that Greta Thunberg's, um, you know, congregation of the mentally unwell where she talked about no climate justice on <laughs> occupied land and you're seeing you're seeing elements of that ignorance and and it, to, to a larger extent genu genuine uh, malicious behavior uh, on uh, a lot of pro-palestinian protests and it's so it's so sad that london has effectively become the capital of uh, anti-israeli sentiment in britain is the canary in the coal mine we saw on this i'm afraid to say and this is a damning indictment of of the state of britain today and, you know, we mentioned how bad it is elsewhere. I mean, what we saw outside of the Sydney Opera House, for example, with the blatant and open anti-Semitism. But I think you're right. What we see here is is a, it's, it's just so widespread in Britain. We've been accepting net migration figures of over 600,000 people net a year. That's, you know, thanks to idiots like Tony Blair and David Cameron. But you're totally right to say that 13 years the Conservatives have been in power. It's not just been David Cameron. We've accepted a load of people into the country who frankly don't share our values and would quite like us to be another country altogether. I mean, I'm reminded of a policy exchange, a think tank report back in 2016, a while ago now, so I imagine it's even worse, in which it found that 40% of British Muslims were said to be supportive of aspects of Sharia law in place of British law. Now, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure out that that says something about the multiculturalism project that the political and media class have waxed lyrical about being an unmitigated success story that has actually been a, an unmitigated disaster for Britain and for the Western world. Um, I think British people are sickened by what they're seeing because what we're witnessing here really is the birth or the explosion of an anti-Semitic street protest movement. That's essentially what this is. We shouldn't mince words about it. I mean, what we saw on Saturday at this supposed March for Peace was people repeating... Arabic war slogans about the slaughter of Jews in the 7th century. There's video footage of people saying, kill all the Jews quite openly. There's um, placards in which the Star of David is presented with a swastika in the heart of it, and people suggesting that Gaza is paired with Auschwitz. Again, racist taunt after racist taunt. And even if you want to dismiss that as a few bad apples, as a lot of people, particularly on the British left, have tried to do, the organisers of this march, the Daily Telegraph did an investigation the other week, Half of the groups who are behind organising these marches have links to Hamas, and not even kind of six degrees of separation. We're talking about one of the groups in particular was founded wow. by a former Hamas chief, who for some reason now lives in, in London. So we need to take this very, very seriously. I think what well, not since the black shirts have we seen such a sustained intimidatory presence on Britain's streets in menacing the Jewish community. And what sickens me most is that there are still mm. many people in positions of influence who don't seem to be taking it that seriously at all. 
Hey, unfortunately, I found myself, and I know mum and dad are watching from the farm tonight, so I hope they don't freak out when I let them know this, but um, my hotel ended up being right in the midst of the 100,000 plus pro-Hamas, pro-Palestinian protests that we saw here yesterday in London. And I had been uh, out and about for the afternoon, um, came across the protest really on Twitter. So I was quite um, surprised, let's say, that the Australian Embassy didn't have any, or the High Commission didn't have any warnings. So I'd say to the High Commissioner, Stephen Smith, maybe you need to have a look at the information you're providing to Australian citizens in the UK because I got my information about the protest from Twitter, now known as X, but also the US Embassy had really good information about where it was happening and the timing. So to get back to my hotel, the, the cabbie, bless him, had to drop me a couple of blocks away. So I had to walk through the pro-Hamas, pro-Palestinian protest to get back to my accommodation. It was still the afternoon, but I decided to cancel my evening plans because I simply didn't feel safe, Corey. Like, it was really intimidating. It was really confronting. I cannot believe that we have 100,000 plus, I assume, UK citizens and or residents protesting in favour of a terrorist organisation that has just attacked Israel and killed innocent citizens in Israel. And there, there are hundreds of well, 100,000 plus people on the streets of, of London protesting pro-Hamas, pro-Palestine. Um, Corey, it's, it was really scary. I just, and my heart breaks. I really feel for anyone Jewish living in London, I would, you would feel incredibly unsafe. But I, I really can't believe the government is, is letting this go on. This was, this was all happening in one of, in and around Westminster, so the parliament, in around um, some of key, London's key tourist attractions, like the National Gallery, it's it's a bit beyond belief, Corey, and it's pretty scary. This has become a reality check for the country. You know, people are saying there's been a rise in, in hate and anti-Semitism. There hasn't been a rise. They're just people that are feeling emboldened enough to, to display their views. And it's kind of shaken Britain to the core because it's made us realise, actually, we're living in a country yes. with people that do not share our values, that hate this country. And, and it's, it's, it's a massive reality check. Obviously, the police has been uh, not as helpful as they could have been. They've been seemingly quite biased in how they manage um, certain protests um, over others. I know. Um, but really, this, this, this is a huge wake-up call for the country. Country. Well, it seems like for the foreseeable future, they're showing no signs of abating. It was the biggest one that we've seen so far. And I think ordinary people really need to take this very, very seriously. I don't want to see a crackdown. I don't think you can fight this kind of hatred with censorship. But I think everyone does need to stand up against these protests because of the open bigotry on display, because of how much um, British Jews are being menaced at this point, and also because of a point that you made, which is that anti-Semitism is a particularly deranging form of racism. When a society has such open expressions of it, you know you're going down a particularly dark path. So I would just urge everyone yes. with a conscience, essentially, to, to oppose what is going on, because history won't be kind to those people who don't. In a solemn commemoration, nations around the world observed Remembrance Day on November 11, honouring the sacrifices of military personnel who lost their lives in the line of duty during conflicts. This day holds profound significance as it serves as a poignant reminder of the human cost of war and the importance of preserving peace. Through ceremonies and moments of silence, Communities unite to express gratitude and reflect on the enduring impact of those who bravely served their countries. On this year's Remembrance Day, pro-Palestine protesters took to the streets of London and marred the sacred day. It was a pity that the march took place on Saturday, but I wouldn't have banned it and didn't want to ban it. In the end, the right to protest is a democratic right, and that's a right that can be exercised whether we approve or disapprove. Indeed, it's easy to approve of protesters who are uh, protesting things of which we approve. Uh, it's more difficult, but more important, to allow them to protest when they're uh, protesting of things that we don't approve of. So if the organisers really wanted it to go ahead, I think it was a right to allow it to go ahead. I don't think they did their cause any good. It wasn't necessary to have done it on Saturday. There's been four marches already. There are plenty of weekends to come between now and Christmas to have more, but that was their choice. Uh, and the main violence, the main yobbish behaviour came from the hard right um, who turned up around the Cenotaph and Downing Street were there. They were the real thugs there. However, there was an element to that march, to the pro-Palestine march, 
which was very unsavory. And you touched on it in your monologue at the beginning. And I think, you know, there's a right to protest, but protesters also have obligations. And their obligation is to stay within the law and within the bounds of democratic legitimacy and proper protest. And I'm afraid anti-Semitism and race hatred and shouting jihad in a clear context of wiping Israel out is not acceptable. And the police will need to get much tougher on that and leave the bulk of the peaceful demonstrators to get on exercising the democratic rights. Yeah. There was also a veteran, Rita, and it broke my heart. I felt really angry seeing this story. It, there were a veteran called Jim Henderson, Scottish bloke, and he described being kicked and punched in his back and side as he fought to get the money he'd been collecting for the poppy appeal out of Edinburgh's w Waverley Station, a major train station in Britain. And eventually the station staff had to step in and rescue him. That was during a Palestinian occupation. If you ask me, it's a damn disgrace. And now we found ourselves in the position where these people think they're above the law. And that's what Suella Braverman was trying to address. Those are the very issues that she was speaking of that are the cause of two-tier policing, where these people on our streets think that they are totally above the law. It simply does not apply to them. Now, of course, the, there are other videos that we've seen as well that two-tier policing being totally evident in those. We had right-wing activists taken to the street, but I actually think a lot of those right-wing activists, Rita, felt compelled to defend the cenotaph, which is perhaps, for those who don't know, the, the nation's, it, it's our symbol, it's, our, it's where we go to pay our respects, our national monument of remembrance, where it's our focus for that day of remembrance. And that's all we wanted, Rita. We just wanted one weekend to remember those young boys and men who died so that Britain could be free and the rest of Europe, it has to be said. And they couldn't even give us that, Rita. I don't think these protests should have been allowed to go ahead, frankly. I think it was an affront to everything we hold dear. The Tory base has got a terrible problem at the moment. They're 20 points behind Labour. The hemorrhaging votes on the right to reform, which is essentially the old Brexit party that's um, chaired by Nigel Farage, they've got about 8% of the vote at the moment. These people wanted these marches banned. And frankly, the vast majority of the British people wanted these anti-Israel marches banned on Remembrance Weekend. And Sawella said, quite correctly, I think, that the Metropolitan Police have been playing favourites with whatever groups have been protesting, whether it's Black Lives Matter on the one hand or... Um, anti-lockdown protests on the other. I mean, it does sound actually very similar to Victoria, I might add. Uh, this mm. is what Suella got herself into so much trouble for, for simply telling the truth that the, pol the police are picking favourites. As it turned out, the police didn't uh, stop this march on the weekend. They should have. And Remembrance Weekend was turned into a farce because of it. 300,000 people marched through the streets of London on Armistice Day and with the most horrific anti-Semitic signage placards and chants that have, as you have quite correctly said, have made the Jewish community in London absolutely terrified. Since the Israel war began, the world has seen an unsettling surge in anti-Semitism. Many Jewish people are feeling alone and vulnerable. And in a show of force last week, a reported 50,000 demonstrators rallied in London against anti-Semitism. The Calm Rally decried the surge in hate crimes against Jews following Hamas's brutal attack on Israel and Israel's counter-offensive in Gaza. The rally wasn't without controversy. Former English Defence League leader Tommy Robinson was arrested and pepper sprayed by Metropolitan Police during the demonstration. Who am I causing alarm and distress to? And this man is a Zionist and a supporter of Israel and he's been arrested. Who am I causing alarm and distress to? No, no, you tell me. Tell me. Time by my watch now. Sorry, officer, but I have a job and I believe in freedom of the press. Listen, 
That's Toby Robinson. There's, I don't know, there's more the officers. Mr Robinson was arrested by dozens of officers outside a nearby cafe over fears his presence would cause alarm and distress. Tommy Robinson is a hugely controversial figure in this country and across the world. He was the uh, former leader of the English Defence League, which I believe is now debunk. But he, he made it very clear on his social media, he's back on Twitter, he made it very clear on his social media that he was going to be at the march. And some of the uh, organisers of the event were very much aware of this and they weren't particularly happy with him coming along because where Tommy Robinson goes disruption often comes to and there can be violence not necessarily from him himself or perpetrated by himself but from people who might go along to show support to him or might cause trouble um, usually you know the football hooligan type might come along but it is interesting that the police have been so soft touch previously when it comes to pro-Palestine march and some of the extreme elements at those marches. But when it comes to Tommy Robinson, they were very quick to get him out of that protest. And this feeds into the narrative that the police decide when they wish to act and they decide when they don't. And often it may be based on politics or what's easier for them to do. Protesters have seized upon the monumental backdrop of London's historic landmarks to etch their grievances and make their agenda heard. In a dramatic collision of past and present, these symbols of resilience and endurance find themselves thrust into the forefront of a tumultuous present-day narrative. Of course, the Metropolitan Police were taken to task over this. Londoners are watching their memorials being graffitied, run all over, so they address it. They say, look, it's deeply disrespectful to climb in a war memorial, but there's no law making it illegal. In the absence of a law, officers cannot automatically arrest, but they can intervene and make it clear the behaviour isn't acceptable. That's what they are seen doing here in this video. Doesn't it sound familiar then, the question that we would then come back asking, which is, well, where's the law then? Which is exactly what we've been asking ourselves as we've watched an angry mob stand outside the Opera House yelling, gas the Jews, and other genocidal slogans. Where's the law? In fact, we were under the impression that you guys already had laws in place, these hate speech <clears throat> laws, this you can't incite anyone to violence laws. Then we get a new Muslim cleric on the front of our papers nearly every other day saying, oh, this is what he's saying. And again, we're like, where are the laws? Where are the laws? Well, even if you put aside hate speech laws, whatever happened to disturbing the peace? Like, surely climbing a war monument would be classified as disturbing the peace. I don't buy for a minute that there isn't a law those coppers could not have found to justify arresting those people. I mean, could you climb any other uh, public monument or any other public building and not be taken down and taken away for, at the very least, your own safety? I refuse to believe that they could not have arrested I think at the end of the day, it's the same point that we've kept coming back to over the last few weeks, which is they are afraid. They don't want to start an sure. out all-out war with <clears throat> these people because they know they are outnumbered. Worse, the protesters know the police are outnumbered and that would turn into potentially a bloodbath. London is a city that has been tested time and time again and has weathered a multitude of challenges, enduring fires, surviving attacks in times of war and confronting the spectre of terrorism. As the pro-Palestine protests unfold, London's response to this latest trial will determine the course of its narrative in the pages of history. Only time will tell if the city can resurge from this latest time of unrest.